Hello and welcome back to Calculus One on this glorious Saturday morning. We are talking about derivatives as rate of change, chapter three, section six at 9.43 a.m. Nice. So we are going to consider application of the derivative now. We are going to take a look at motion and understand how derivatives help us understand motion. The most fundamental formula from physics says that distance is equal to rate times time. Now, this word rate is rooted in our title, derivatives as rates of change. And if you solve for this rate, you see that the rate is distance, say measured in miles, divided by time, measured in hours, so you see that the units for this rate is mile per hour. Now you call that what? Miles per hour, speed. So you see that this rate is actually speed. When you consider motion from point A to point B, That motion has the distance given as B minus A. And if you left at time T1 and arrived at the time T2, the time is T2 minus T1. So you see that you can write the speed as B minus A over T2 minus T1. And if we use our calculus, right, we are going to say change in distance over change in time. This triangle thingy, delta, is change. And it's simply subtraction of T2 minus T1, D2 minus D1, or whatever you're measuring. Now, we have to be very careful. This formula that you know already is a very specific formula. Observe what you get here. This is your basic slope of the line from algebra. And if you study 3.1 at all, you recognize that formula as slope of the secant line. And I already told you that that one measures the averages. Therefore, the formula change in distance over change in time gives you the average speed. The only way you can measure this average speed is after you are done moving. You have to go through the entire trip and end that trip to be able to measure your average speed. Because average speed takes into account all of your speeds throughout your trip and smooths it out, averages out. When you start your trip you start the car that it's parked i hope right you don't jump into the car right there's cars already moving 60 miles per hour you jump into it and right so your car is parked and then along the way you have all of these suggested red lights and stop signs so hopefully you stop on all of those right 
So your speed might be, let's say you are on, on 22, speed limit is 55. You might be going speed limit, but if there is a red light, you're going to slow down and you're going to stop. And then you're going to wait for five seconds. It's going to turn green and then you're going to again accelerate. The graph of that would be something like this. This is where you start at home. Uh, velocity, which is speed, is zero. We are talking in time. Then you accelerate, right? And then you're driving, 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 and then there is a stop sign. Your velocity is zero. And then you accelerate, 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 accelerate. Actually, this was a red light. And then there's a stop sign, right? And then you accelerate. People usually don't stop on a stop sign. They just go slow down, right? And then they speed up. It's a famous story that uh, my friend told me from from Texas where the guy went through a stop sign like that and got pulled over and um, cop said you went through a stop sign and I say well I really really slow down is this still a ticket no 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 you know I almost come on man the license and registration the guy puts the license and registration through the through the window cop grabs the hand <laughs> it's like would you like me to stop or go slower Right? It's a difference between the two of them. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So you get the idea. And then you finally arrive to the destination. And then you hopefully stop. Right? So what is the average speed? Average speed would be somewhere over here, let's say. Right? Because you've been, uh, it's going to be, to be closer to the peak right speed um, because you spent more time going faster than going slower so <clears throat> um, average speed is going to be this line here this value here is the the average speed now what is your speedometer you see that the speedometer as soon as you touch either accelerator or decelerator those are your two pedals that you have. Uh, some of you with three legs have three pedals. But, but uh, you have a gas pedal, right, to accelerate, and you have brake to decelerate. They both change your speed. What concept would measure this instantaneous speed? Well, that's going to be our derivative. So you have algebra and slope of the linear line to take care of the average speed. And you have the derivative to take care of the instantaneous speed. When you are pulled over, you are pulled over for the instantaneous speed, the derivative one. That's the one that changes in an instant. You are not pulled over for the average speed because cops usually don't pace people from their house driveway to school, you know, 25 miles <laughs> along the way. And then, oh, yeah, your average speed didn't really work, work out to be what it's supposed to be. So here's a ticket for you. So the average speed. Now, we have formulas in um, algebra you learn that the average speed, well, you don't learn this, but you know the formula for the slope, is going to be <clears throat> the f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a. Now, you've seen this formula as y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 in algebra, and you've seen it just like this in your pre-calculus 1 class uh, when you learned rates of change in chapter one. So this formula, as you can see, survives all of these steps. But the next one, instantaneous speed, is the limit of f of b minus f of a over b minus a. But that we know it's our the derivative. We know that's our derivative. So, 
So now, <clears throat> if I give you position function, f of t equals, I can call it p of t, s of t. Generally, they use s of t because the word position has s in it. I guess, I don't know. Um, f of t, say, is x squared minus 3x plus 9. Find the velocity, find acceleration. Find velocity function. Find acceleration function. Well, velocity function is going to be the derivative, which is 2x minus 3. And acceleration function, a of t, is just 2. You keep taking derivatives. So now, I'm going to ask some very uh, interesting questions. For instance, I mean, they're interesting to me. I don't know about your lives. I'm going to ask where am I at t equals to 5 seconds? If I ask this question, it should be common sense that we are supposed to use position function to compute because position function will give us location. And I'm asking that so after five seconds of my trip. So to answer that, I will use position function and compute that at five. So that's going to be 25 minus 15 plus nine. And I will have my... <coughs> location as 19 19 miles away 19 centimeters away whatever uh, it might be so 19 whatever the units are meters m meters what is my velocity or speed what is my speed at t equals 5 seconds? Well, clearly, we're going to use the velocity formula for that, which is speed. So answer would be v of 5, which is 2 times 5 minus 3, which is 7 meters per second. So my speed is 7 meters per second, and that's the instantaneous speed. This is what the speedometer reads. It's that, you know, instant glance you have, and it's 7. And it can change in every, every fraction of a second can change. What is my acceleration at t equals 5 seconds? And your answer will be what? Two. two. It's always two. Because we found from that that it's always two. So acceleration at five is two. Meter per second per second or meter per second squared. Um, how did you find the acceleration? Derivative of the, it's the second derivative. So <coughs> derivative and derivative. Okay, so it's, okay. What is the <coughs> average speed from three to five seconds of my trip? <coughs> what do I use here? I use <coughs> f of five minus f of three divided by five minus three. 
f of 5 we already know is 19 minus f of 3 we compute f of 3 that's uh, 9 minus so it's 9 divided by 2 and uh, the trip from 5 to uh, 3 to 5 seconds is 5 meters per second observe that the top of f's the position function is distance divided by the 5 minus 3 which is time it's uh, 3 seconds to 5 seconds the common sense for these units is meters per second so 19 minus 9 is 10 divided by 2 is 5 so I want you to observe that my velocity now just guys let's use some common sense here because uh, this concept should be this concept should be clear because you just live in this world, all right? Velocity at 5 is 7. My average velocity from 3 to 5 seconds is 5. It should be common sense that it's a smaller number because I am accelerating all the time. Accelerating meaning going faster and faster and faster. Every split second, I'm going faster than the previous split second that we observed. So, 3 to 5 is the interval of 2 seconds. And I have the acceleration of 2 meters per second per second. So, at 5, my, uh, I'm gaining... Two meters per second and then at four and then at three and at two and at one at all times i'm going faster my velocity increases so the average velocity is five because i used to go much slower you have you can compute this at three at three this becomes six minus three is three so you see my velocity was three meters per second at three my velocity is seven meters per second at um, five. Ooh, right. Works out to five again. So, average speed is your algeb algebra calculation. You are calculating the slope of the line, and the instantaneous speed is the derivative, where you are calculating. Uh, that instantaneous speed, <coughs> which is what your speedometer reads. The next part of this lecture is the experiment. Behold the object, right? This is marker, and we are going to perform now an experiment. Ready? There we go. Experiment over. So, what was this experiment? This experiment showed us that the objects that are thrown in gravitational field fall down and the motion is parabolic motion. This is what Newton figured out. So, if I am to throw an object, the object will do this. And it does that in time. So now, uh, later on in the course, we are going to derive these formulas. Now I'm just telling you what these formulas are. Uh, you learned in physics that your y height of the object, and you just saw the experiment, is given as negative 1 half gt squared plus v zero t plus y zero you memorize this formula in physics in mathematics we actually derive it now when you're looking at this formula the very important part to connect first is that you have negative t squared uh, we know that t plays the role of x we know that negative x squared graphs this way, so it all matches, right? T 
is our variable because we are talking about velocity, acceleration, and all of these things in time. So now, if I take the derivative of this mass here, we get the derivative of y over t, which is actually velocity. It's a change of position in time. Uh, t squared, the derivative of that is 2t, which kills a half, so we get negative gt. g is the acceleration of gravity, right? So it's a constant, 9.81 if you use meters per second, or 32.2 uh, if you're using feet per second squared. So g is what we copy, and then uh, 2t, 2 will kill the half, so you have negative gt, plus... The derivative of t is 1, so just the number v0, and the derivative of y0, which is a constant. So now you have this formula, which you definitely seen in your physics class. It was probably written as final velocity is initial velocity plus acceleration times time. You probably know this formula from kinematics from your physics class. That's that formula except I'm using g as acceleration. And g points down, so negative. That's all it is. So now I have that the velocity is equal to negative gt plus v0. And now I can take the derivative of that, change of velocity. What changes velocity? Well, obviously, acceleration changes velocity, right? Change in velocity is acceleration because you change your speed, your velocity at which you are going using a car. You change it by pushing accelerator, which is the gas pedal, or decelerator, which brakes. Both of those change speed. One changes it forward, one changes it backwards. So when I take another derivative, I just get negative g. Acceleration, gravity, right? So for objects that we throw, they go with acceleration g, gravity. Now, if you're learning these formulas, you stop and reflect and think for a second. If you're trying to memorize all of this, first of all, does this make sense? Everything happens in time. That's where you start. Okay, so the main variable, the independent variable has to be time. The object will fall with gravity. Gravity, and it's to be negative term because that marker hit the ground. It's important how much initial velocity I give to this marker because that v0 there is the initial velocity. So my arm is the one that gives initial velocity to the marker. That marker went all the way to the other end of the room. This marker with much smaller v0 <laughs> thrown from the same height, which is y0, is not going to go that far because velocity here, initial velocity, was much lower than the V0 I used to throw the black marker, which was the first experiment. And now, the same initial velocity, but from larger Y0. So now, when I do this, it hit the floor <laughs> and bounced off. It has to go further away. So experiment again. So the green marker there was this initial velocity from this height. Now I'm going to raise y0, which is initial height, and throw with the same initial velocity, and then it's going to go further. What happened? It hit the cap and bounced back. So it looked like it, it fell. So... Um, 
you have gravity which pulls everything down to fall it's negative you have a v0 of how hard you throw stuff and you have y0 which which height you throw from right that's the reason why you don't want you know three three and a half feet feet twelve feet of playing back because y0 is not good make sense but you definitely want them playing soccer <laughs> Now, we also observe that there is a max height over here on the top of that thing. The pen just died. Come on, Pen, wake up. No, a pen actually stopped uh, working completely. I have to. Do the good old reconnect. the beautiful thing about Microsoft you can fix the car this way you know car breaks down on the highway you just exit the car lock it unlock it start up the engine and just drive off that's how awesome cars would be if Microsoft made them yeah but it's still like Windows yeah. X came out the year except yeah. for the Windows 10 Update that just came out that was blue screen looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah most recent for like half. Yeah, they're, 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 they're ironing that out. A third of the users are getting blue screen. Really? Yeah, the computers are trash. Okay, well, I don't really One third, you said? Yeah, I should get slot. That's why you should never use a Windows update when it first comes out. Yeah, those usually doesn't work fine without all right so what do we have uh, what else do we have so guys what can i ask i can ask <clears throat> for instance where is the object at five seconds <laughs> do you see the questions over here where is the object at five seconds you calculate the point how fast is it moving at five seconds you calculate because you have all the formulas you just need to plug stuff in and they're going to say a baseball is hit, right? Or baseball is thrown and the baseball goes this way or a football or whatever else. You fire a cannon, all of these kind of things. Um, they go this way. So <clears throat> what, is the, uh, what is the equation that you would look at? y of time which is the height right at the object so i'll put is going to be uh negative 4.9 right that's half of 9.81 so negative uh, 4.9 t squared plus whatever initial velocity you have plus whatever initial height you have so initial velocity initial height so that's one of the equations if you're working in the meters and seconds or y equals negative 16.1 t squared plus v0 t plus y0 if you are using imperial units so feet So this one is uh, meters and this one is feet. You read the problem, they will say the ball is thrown 
at initial speed of 50 feet per second. You immediately know it's a second equation because speed per second tells you you are using the one with negative 16.1. And the number 50 that was given, initial velocity, right, you put that for V0. The ball is thrown from the ground, the ball is thrown from the fifth floor, right? You go, oh, fifth floor, that's uh, 12 feet per floor, right? So 60. <laughs> you figure things out. <clears throat> Plug those, you have the equation, derivative gives you velocity, and then another derivative will just give you 32.2, which is gravity meters per second squared. So. How fast is the object moving in three seconds? You plug that in. Now, the interesting question is at what time the object reaches maximum height? That is a cool question. Because clearly objects will reach maximum height somewhere, right? This is your height y in time t and you throw something parabolically there is this max height vertex. yes it's a vertex of parabola and that's the hack way to solve it you can find the vertex but there is also another cool way what happens to the velocity of the object at the top yes Observe the marker. Let's do the experiment. Observe this marker and realize at the top it stopped and changed the direction. See that? It stops and then changes direction. Stops, changes direction. So for the vertical motion, the object will go up, 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 and remember that gravity is slowing it down. And then it's going to reach the maximum height at which point it has zero velocity and then gravity pulls on it and gravity doesn't really pull on it it distorts space and, and it falls down so what's important to realize is that uh, velocity here is equal to zero so at this point in time you have maximum velocity maximum height and zero velocity so that's going to be uh, something I was about to anyway. oh what did I say I'm just so the maximum height yes velocity is zero at maximum height so you can always find the time by setting the velocity equation equal to zero. So our velocity equation, yeah. our velocity equation, which was negative gt uh, plus v0, set equal to zero to get time at which we have maximum height. So all you do. So example. You have y equals negative 16.1 t squared plus um, whatever, 32t plus 6 feet tall, right, thrown from right here. Your velocity equation immediately, oh, uh, find max, so find max height. Your velocity equation is immediately negative 32.2t plus 32. And we set this equal to zero. 
so we get 0 is equal to negative 32.2 t plus 32 so t equals one second yes yeah, some decimal but no one cares so t equals one second this means max height achieved at t equal one second that's what it means so now i take that one second and i bring it back into my equation y equals negative 16.1 times 1 squared plus 32 plus 6 and we see that we get y equal about 22 feet max height there are, there's the decimal there right point 0.1 um, so it will be point 0.9 so 21.9 no one cares well so when you are looking at this right the maximum height will be 22 feet and that's achieved by um, after one second after the throw Cool, right? Of course, man. And physics. So if you lived, you know, just 400 years ago and figured this out, you'll be immortal today. Right? Uh, how about a little bit of business and economics? Anyone interested? Nice. It's just for you. Nicholas. You. You're welcome. What we are going to do now is um, mathematical analysis of cost. Now, for whatever reason, the entire field of economics and, and, and finance and so on is allergic to the word derivative. They found the, uh, felt the need to change the word derivative to word marginal. So anytime you hear in your field word marginal, it's just a derivative. Now marginal does have less letters, but then it has the j in it. So I don't know how is that. Derivative kind of goes smoother than marginal. Like there's the j. But that's okay. Let's take a look at average cost and marginal cost. Average cost is the cost function divided by the number of units produced. So you have the cost of the entire production. You have a great example uh, United States finally has a car manufacturer that it's actually American car manufacturer called Tesla it's the only one that exists now everything else is not produced in United States so I'm not going to talk about Ford or GM or any of these that have their factories in Mexico Tesla is the only American car manufacturer that has research development production and distribution all in United States so that's it and it's the best car that it ever been built to work that out you have to set up facilities and that costs a lot of money you have to create the machines that will create these things that costs a lot of money so there are fixed costs you make a machine that is going to make hundred thousand cars so you set that machine and say that machine costs $23 million. $23 million is your fixed cost. Now let's say that machine makes the body for the car, right? It stamps parts and, right. So you still have to pay on top of that 
all of the steel or aluminum and everything else that goes into making that per car. That's called variable cost. So to make an object, you have to pay for the machine that makes it, pay for the, uh, well, no, machine that makes it, which is you're setting up the building, you're setting up the machine once, fixed cost. And then you have the variable cost per unit. The more you make, the more manpower, the more electricity, the more raw materials that need to be uh, brought into the factory. And that's going to be the variable cost because that is cost for the unit. When you add those two parts, right, plus the cost of all other things, the taxes, regulations, water and stuff, you get the cost for the cost function. It's a cost function because it depends on the number of units you make. If you make one of something, it tends to be extremely expensive. We call that art. You paint one painting and it costs $30,000. Why? Because there is one. And it takes long time to make that. If it's amazing, say eight months. So $30,000 is only one and that's it. Or you make 17 million units and each one costs 20 cents. Make sense? So now, when you um, have the cost function, to figure out the average cost per unit, you divide your cost function by the number of units that you are producing and that creates this formula of average cost. Now we know that average and marginal are not the same, which means the average and derivative are not the same. And uh, you can uh, create the marginal cost formula by simply taking the derivative of the cost formula. So now you have these two formulas. If you understand these two formulas, you can do some serious business. Because you understand your cost. Reducing the cost helps the profit. If you have good profit, you have better R&D, research and development, and you can further develop your product and um, stay competitive on the market and uh, keep doing the business. With extreme costs, your profits are down. You can hire less quality people to keep developing your products. And then um, you can, um, and then obviously you fall because the competition just eats you alive. In which case you have to merge with someone or throw the gloves and walk away. Those are the, the those are the. So now, the example that is given in a textbook is absolutely amazing to do the, uh, so I'm going to go through that example and I believe you have two or three examples uh, to try on your own for homework. They say that the cost function for some kind of production that is going to make thousands units of something um, is given by negative 0.02x squared plus 50x plus 100. Now, what I'm going to tell you is whatever they're making, thousand of, um, so zero less than x less than thousand, uh, it costs hundred bucks to set up production. That's the fixed cost right there. And this part over here is the variable part, which is um, the cost per unit produced, which is um, right the materials and uh, salaries for workers and everything else. So now we are going to first figure out the average cost. So C average is when you divide this one by X. So C divided by X, uh, which is clearly negative 0.02 X plus 50. 
So that's our uh, average cost function. And the marginal cost function is the derivative, which is negative 0.04x plus 50. So we have these two functions. Yes. Oh, 100 over, yeah, yes, 100 over x, oops. Plus 100 over x, you're right. When you divide by x, you divide every term. And then for c prime, um, that derivative of 100 is 0, so it goes away. Great. <clears throat> so let's analyze what happens for 100 units. By the way, what are the units for cost? Dollars. Yes, so dollars. Let's analyze for 100 units. If you are making 100 units, let's analyze the cost. So what's the average cost for 100 units? Well, that's going to be C average of 100. We plug 100 in the formula up there. We get negative 2 plus 50 plus 1. We get 49 dollars per unit. The average cost for each unit is going to be $49. Cost means to make it. So can you sell this for $36 a piece? Can you sell it for $50 a piece? What kind of profit you're going to have? What is the... Yeah, I know, but w how much margin do you want to sell something? For this? Okay. If it's Apple products, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, you're gonna have, you're gonna have people to buy it and you put it like thousand for this, because people are already buying the garbage at whatever price. So, <laughs> it's the only company that is able to market their garbage products and, and actually sell it. It is, it is amazing. It's, it's I. It's the only thing that I cannot really understand in this world. How is Apple doing that? What kind of forces are in there in their marketing to take the garbage product and market it as the best thing ever and actually trick people into buying it? I will never understand that. I tried. I, I looked at the lectures. I looked at the reports. I looked at the... I will never, ever, ever understand that. But, all right, let's go. With... Um, Marginal cost. So now we know the cost of, so this is the average cost per unit to make 100 pieces. I want to see how much now with the marginal cost, what is the price of the 100th unit? So cost to produce 100th unit. Well, it's going to be negative 4 plus 50. And we are going to get $46. This means that the 100th unit cost $46 to make. <laughs> How much is the first unit? The first unit is when you put one, right? So the first unit is going to be $49.96. Do you see that? So if, if you are thinking about the cost of the first unit produced, first unit produced, well, you put one in the derivative. Because remember, the derivative is that instantaneous change. You can actually do the derivative per unit for each single unit. You can figure out the cost of the first unit, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the hundredth. So, this smooths everything out. Remember driving. You have to stop on a stop sign. You have to stop on the red sign. You started with zero. You end trip with zero, but you drive, right? 55, 65, 95, right? 
And then you add all of those together and it smooths it out to, I don't know, 53 average speed. That's this guy, 49 bucks for all. But you see that the 100th unit, which is actually the last one produced in there, is actually $46. So this analysis tells you that the more units you make, the cheaper it is to make it. And you see that the first unit would cost you $49.96, and this one is already almost four bucks cheaper to make the 100. Well, now we're going to ask ourselves what happens on the 900 unit level. So the average cost for 900 units. Average cost for 900 units is uh, negative 0 0.02 times 900 plus 50 plus 100 over 900. Uh, to compute this, uh, this would be uh, the same as negative 2 times 9 plus 50 plus <clears throat> 1 divided by 9. Um, so that's 1 divided, 1 divided by 9. Now that's point one 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 one. Now since we are dealing with cents, I am allowed to use only two decimal places. So I have negative eighteen plus fifty plus eleven cents. So what's the answer? Thirty-two dollars eleven cents. Thank you. Dollars per unit. <gasps> Look at that. If you are making only hundred units, it costs you forty-nine per unit on average. If you are making nine hundred units, it costs you thirty-two eleven per average. Right? Remember, one painting, extremely expensive. Seventeen million markers produced, twenty cents a piece. All right. Finally, what is the margin now cost of 900 unit? So, guys, marginal cost produced, uh, uh, marginal cost computes the price of the single unit. This thing over here averaged 900 costs in one number. The the this one is going to give you 900 unit. So what do I have? I have negative 0 0.04 times 900 plus 50. Well, this becomes negative 4 times 9, which is negative 36 plus 50. We get what? $14 per unit. 100th unit cost 46 900 unit costs 14 bucks to make all right so you want to work these bulks right now if you make way too many right then then there's a supply and demand and everything else that you have to know and learn and study to um make the good business decisions so when you are listening to elon musk talk and when he gives some analysis he does this right when he talks about improving by the factor of two and improving by factor of something that's a different different concept but he had a talk about uh, Model 3 coming out um, where he was talking about the price because we know Model S is $100,000, right? When you factor everything in, it's $100,000. And um, he knew that certain people will have money so he can start setting up the production. And now he's ready to do the Model 3, right? So he did the two expensive models first because the car enthusiasts people who have money will buy those cars 
he didn't go with the model 3 which is basically the consumer version of the stuff he just started a production on that model s hundred thousand dollars model x right the suv hundred and forty thousand dollars now to make those cars right you start and you make first few and it is extremely expensive and then the more you make the cheaper it is and now when the production is in place when he developed the factory enough to push model 3 through right he's going for $14 per car I mean not $14 per car but you know uh, he's no longer making 100 units right so if you want to be you know in business and you want to be running something like that if and you don't understand this well forget about it because you will fail you have to do this kind of analysis and you have to just know them like this to be able to to work things out uh, there's another concept in a book of elasticity uh, which is also um, in economics, right? So you can, if you're interested in that stuff, you can read that and, uh, um, right, the demand. Um, and I think that, yep, that's it. So that's 3.6, the average rate of change, which is your algebra equation or pre-calc equation, whatever you want to call it. And then when you add derivative to it, you're getting your instantaneous rate of change which is the derivative uh, also called marginal in business we're going to take the break and when we come back chain rule yes